Well, good morning to one and all. I am Randolph Barnwell, the Senior Elder of Gate Ministries Durban Central, and it's my privilege to welcome all of those who have elected to join us this morning. Today represents our 10th session in dealing with the subject of forgiveness. And we have explored several principles up to this point in which we sought to look at various portions of scripture and case studies and extract principles governing the whole issue of forgiveness. Now, in today's session, I just want to look at a few issues. One is the whole dynamic of how an unforgiving person is tortured. And then we're going to proceed to exploring the whole culture of forgiveness as a corporate dynamic and not just a personal one and then seek to isolate one or two blessings that are associated with forgiveness in its corporate expression. Now the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18 has been the subject of our focus throughout this specific series. The unforgiving servant is labeled as wicked and is handed over to the torturers to be tortured. I want to read the last part of the parable with you in Matthew 18 from verses 32 to verse 35. It says the following, Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, this is the king saying to the unforgiving servant, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Now it is very clear here that the unforgiving servant is handed over to torturers to torture him. And Jesus said anybody who is then unforgiving that the Heavenly Father will do exactly the same to you, to me, if we do not forgive our brothers from the heart. So torture then is the result or the consequence of unforgiveness. To be unforgiving is to recruit upon yourself torture that is permitted by God your heavenly father. Now this result the unforgiving person incurs upon themselves for their refusal or disobedience in respect to forgiving a brother or an enemy who has hurt them in some respect. I said to you previously in this series that forgiveness is not an option. Forgiveness is an act of obedience. You literally do not have the luxury of choice. If you are God's son and if someone has hurt you to any degree, biblically, you are commanded to forgive the other in a bid to represent God your father and also to obey his word. The unforgiving person incurs a range of consequences upon their being and two Sundays ago I listed at least 20 repercussions of unforgiveness. Now all of those 20 negative results of unforgiveness smack of being tortured. In this parable the unforgiving servant was handed over to torturers to torment him or to torture him. Now, the whole idea of torture wells up or conjures up within your and my understanding the infliction of some pain, either physically, mentally, 
um, or otherwise that is excruciating and that potentially could be very, very traumatic. Now, unforgiveness hurts only one person. It only hurts the person who hosts the bitterness and not the person who caused the offense. This result of torture is upon the person that is not forgiving. When you maintain a disposition of unforgiveness within your being, what you are doing, you are giving Satan open invitation to torment you, to oppress you at one level or the other. And although God is your Father, your Heavenly Father who loves you, but yet God your Father is bound to principles. And if you choose, if you elect to disobey Him by not forgiving someone that has hurt you, what you incur upon your being is torture, is pain, is serious traumatic repercussions upon your mind, upon the domain specifically of your soul. Somebody once said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. The only person that is going to suffer is the person that is unforgiving. Now I want to challenge you. Why must you suffer such torture when in the first place, you might have been completely innocent. Somebody else sinned and hurt you. Somebody else violated principle, let's say abused you or betrayed you or misaligned your character. They sinned, not you. Now you sitting with unforgiveness in reference to their sin against you and you suffer. They might repent of their sin and get on with God and proceed to great blessing in God. And here are you sitting, hurt, still festering in anger, resentment, pain and bitterness. And you give open door to an experience of torture that will inflict your life. Now to understand why this is so, the Greek word for torturer is Basinestes and Basinestes means the following one who applies torture, an inquisitor, one who elicits truth by the use of the rack. Now, an inquisitor here is an old English word of one that is used to describe one who tortures another but who does so very harshly, very severely, in a very hostile fashion, so as to elicit information or to gather truth. So the whole idea of this word torturer here is used of this inquisitor who inflicts pain upon the one who is tortured, so as to bring that person to some admission of truth or to elicit some information. And even when the word torture is used or torture tactics is used in our world today, it is usually used in context where the torturer wants the one tortured to admit to something or he is after certain information that the one tortured seeks to withhold from him. Now, the, the Greek word basanistes literally means here that the inquisitor will torture to elicit information by the use of the rack. Now, the rack, as you can see on your screen, was this rectangular wooden apparatus on which the one to be tortured would be tied with his hands on one end bound and at the ankles the other end and both the wrists and the ankles at either end are attached to a system of levers and pulleys and these would simultaneously be tightened so as to stretch the person in a bid to dislodge the person progressively 
from the shoulders, the hips, elbows, knees, ankles, etc. Now, you can obviously imagine the excruciating pain that this will bring to bear upon the one that is tortured. Now, if you think about it, this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, my father will do the same to you. Now, when you understand the objective behind the torture, you can understand why Jesus said that torture is necessary. The whole idea in the Greek behind this concept of torture is to bring the one tortured to an admission of truth. So the whole idea is redemptive in this context. The whole idea is to literally save the person. Now I want to challenge you. You either listen to God your Father, obey His command and forgive people that have hurt you, or you remain unforgiving and then God has to simply allow experiences or circumstances to be permitted in your life that will bring upon your soul such excruciating pain, such traumatic experiences with an intent to bring you to that place by which you will then forgive the person that has hurt you. And I would encourage you, why learn the hard way? Why learn through the act of pain and torture that you need to come to the place of forgiveness? Many, many people, when they do not forgive and have God has to subject them to a process of such painful um, torture at one degree of pain or the other, simply because of their disobedience. That is so unnecessary because you lose time and you could lose so much in the process before you eventually come to the place of I need to forgive. In the act of torture, it was hoped that the torture would be so intense that the one tortured would come to a place of truth, a place of compliancy, a place of obedience. Now, some of the negative effects of unforgiveness in the life of the Son of God are, are many, like I've said, but generally it affects the person's body, their soul, and their spirit. And I just want to speak to some of the areas of torture that might take place in these three realms. Now, obviously, in the physical body, um, one of the results of unforgiveness is sickness and disease. Now, in, for example, the celebration of the Lord's table, or as it's publicly known, the Lord's Supper, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. He said, Therefore, whoever eats the body, or eats the bread, or drinks the cup, of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. So Paul, within the context of the Lord's table here, puts forth a reason as to why some people suffer illness, disease, and even premature death. His reference to sleep here indicates dying prematurely. And he says, if when you come to celebrate communion or the Lord's Supper or the table of the Lord, as some people call it, and you partake in an unworthily manner, you are guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, he says, you fail to accurately judge or discern the Lord's body. Now, the Lord's body is not the bread that you eat. The Lord's blood is not the juice that you drink. 
that was a physical body with which Jesus died. But today we have a, a mystical body of Christ. The body of Christ today is literally his church made up of many members, many sons of God constituting the spiritual family of the Lord. And when Paul said that you incur judgment upon yourself when by your participation in the sacraments, the, the bread and the juice, you fail to judge accurately the Lord's body, which is a church made up of multiple sons, all relating to one another. So if, for example, if you participate in that sacrament, having unforgiveness to a brother, you could incur upon your body sickness, disease, and even suffer premature death. So it's very, very important whenever you participate in communion, that you ensure that you have a proper attitude a proper mindset, a proper disposition of love, care, concern, compassion, kindness to all of the members of the body of Christ. And that body of Christ does not just concern your local church. I'm talking about the universal, global body of Christ. People in other churches, in other flows, in other networks, across all persuasions, you and I, are expected to love the entirety of the body of Christ. There are many illnesses or diseases that some people have which are the result of unforgiveness or failure to discern the body of Christ as they should. Some illnesses, diseases, even problems generally are psychosomatic. The word psychosomatic has reference to any problem, specifically bodily issues like disease and, and illness, which have their root cause in the mind of the person. So they're psychosomatic. The word psycho from the word psych, a reference to the mind, and the word somatic from soma, meaning body. So psychosomatic, you have a bodily illness, but the cause is in the psych or the thinking of the person. The Bible teaches that as a man thinks, so is he. And there are some people sitting with illness and disease for which even if you pray, they will not become healed because the illness is nothing but a symptom, a fruit of a root cause of that illness, which is unforgiveness in the mentality of the person. And if you are listening to me this morning, you might be viewing and you might be saying to me, Randolph, that's me. The cure for your illness will not come from a prayer for healing. The cure for your illness will come from a decision in your heart and in your mind to forgive the people that have hurt you. And I want to challenge you the moment you come to a place of decision to forgive, in your heart and in your mind. It's almost as if your body, your physicality will then correct itself, will then function as it should. In Jesus's use of the torturer year in Matthew 18, when on that rack the torturers would stretch the body, the intent was ultimately if that person did not come to an admission of truth in that context, would be to dismember the body. And a dislocated, dismembered body cannot function. And I want to I say this to all of us. Unforgiveness has that picture in the mind of one who is on a rack, stretched out by torturers, with an intent to dislocate the body if the person does not come to an admission of truth. If you do not come to a place where you forgive reflexively, it's almost like even this whole body becomes dislocated. And a dislocated body is a non-functional body. There's no rest. There's no ease in the body. So the body becomes diseased 
void of ease. It becomes ill and non-functional as it should. But the moment you forgive, your body seems to correct itself. In his prayer for, uh, that Jesus taught us as to how we should pray, he said to pray like this. And the end part of the prayer says this, Forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation and then deliver us from evil. The prayer for deliverance from evil comes after forgive us as we forgive others. The moment you forgive others, not only do you receive forgiveness from God, but you enter a domain called, I will be delivered from all evil. So in your body, you can experience health that is given to you by the Lord through acts of forgiveness of those who have hurt you. And then in your soul too, you can experience peace. The mind of the unforgiving person is tortured. There's no rest. There's no ease. You never come to a place of composure. You never come to a place of equilibrium mentally. But you're in a constant state of trouble in the mind because of the matter of unforgiveness lies unresolved within your thinking. In 3 John and verse 2, it says the following, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. Okay, again, the, the prosperity of the soul will determine the health of the body. John says, I pray that you will be, that you will prosper and you will be in good health as your soul prospers. And I want to encourage you, your soul needs rest. Your mind, your thinking needs to come into a place of absolute peace. But so long as you maintain an unforgiving disposition within your heart, you will never come to a place where your soul is at rest or your soul is at peace. And a soul that is in unrest because of unforgiveness is a soul that lacks prosperity. And when your soul lacks prosperity, your health will wane or decline. And even you will not experience prosperity in every other domain or expression of prosperity, including financial prosperity. And that is something I hope to deal with perhaps next week. So in your body, there's torture. In your soul, there's torture. But even in your spirit, man, you could experience a level of defilement through a disposition of unforgiveness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 2, verse 1 and 2, it says the following, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. Now, Paul here in context speaks to the Corinthians who were somewhat alienated from the apostle because a certain sector of the church at Corinth were influenced by false apostles that subtly influenced some of the Corinthian believers away from engaging the apostle Paul as they should have engaged a spiritual father. So what happened? There was this influence of a false apostolic stream in the city of Corinth. And as a result, through false news and rumor, a large section of the church at Corinth literally closed off their hearts to Paul as an apostle. And Paul claims to have fathered a major section of the city by his preaching of the gospel and in fact if you take the time to read the previous chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 he even argues that his heart is not closed and he commands them that they must be open in their hearts towards him 
Again here, if you look at verse 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he says again, make room for us in your hearts. So in some of the Corinthians, they developed this um, bitterness, subtle bitterness towards the Apostle Paul and started to close their hearts off to him as father. Now, where you have a closed heart, a closed heart blocks grace flow. For grace to flow from your spiritual oversight towards you, you need to have an open heart towards your spiritual leader. If for whatever reason there comes relational tension between you and your spiritual oversight, you need to resolve it as a matter of urgency and don't accommodate for it. You know why? Because if you do not, your heart subtly becomes closed progressively over time. And such that however, however pregnant your spiritual oversight or father might be with resource from heaven to benefit you with the grace of God, with the truth of God's word to benefit you, every time that is espoused or communicated, it never lands on your spirit because your heart has been closed. But here's the thing. Paul then says to them in verse 1, that we, they must cleanse themselves, we must cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, okay, and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So what happened to the Corinthian believers is that their, not just their flesh, but their spirit became defiled. Now what I know of bitterness, it hits the soul. Bitterness camps in the soul. The soul invites bitterness to settle if unchecked. And if that bitterness is accommodated long enough, it leaks into your spirit. Now, it's your spirit part of you where the grace of God is intended to land every time you hear the words of the Lord. But if the soul is bitter and that bitterness leaks into the spirit, the heart becomes closed and there's no room made for your spiritual oversight in your heart such that even when words are released that are designed to benefit you, they do not because of a, of a closed heart. But Paul also says that not only is the spirit defiled, but the flesh too and the body is defiled also. So what tends to happen in people that have succumbed to a defilement of spirit, a contamination in spirit, when they have undoubt issues of offense in reference to spiritual leadership, is that they are then more prone to resign themselves to fleshly indulgences. So if you take the time to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul would challenge them before you would start chapter 7, that to watch their company, to watch their behavior, um, and not to keep company with, with, with unbelievers to the degree where that carnal company will soil their godly character. Um, I have noted very often in those with protracted bitterness that is unchecked, unresolved, how that in time, they simply give themselves over or are more prone to succumb to sinful indulgences related to fleshly issues. And this is a warning um, to us all. This is a warning to us all not to go this way. And I want to encourage you never make a major decision from the context of bitterness. Never make a major decision, a life altering decision from the context of an offensive heart. Never make critical decisions from when your heart is within a state of being contaminated through an unchecked, unresolved issue. Now, to illustrate this point of how that, for example, a son can, can make a foolish decision because of undoubted bitterness, I just want to reference one or two case studies. Esau sold his birthright to his twin brother, Jacob, and Jacob extracted that birthright 
through deceiving his father, Isaac, into blessing him with that birthright. Esau, the brother, became so angry and became filled with bitterness, hatred, anger and offense towards his brother Jacob. And to such a degree, when he perceived that it was their father's wish that both the boys do not marry women from the Canaanites or women from any of the sons of Heth, Esau took it upon himself to decide to do exactly what his father did not want. I want to read the text in Genesis 28 and verse 6. It says the following, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take himself a wife from there. And that he blessed him and charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padanaram. Notice, Jacob obeyed his father by not taking a wife from the daughters of Canaan. So Esau checks this out. Remember now, Esau is embittered, he's angry, he's offended, he's unforgiving. And notice the result or the consequence in Esau. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael and married. Besides the wives that he had, Mahalalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Neboeth. So Esau embittered. Esau, unforgiving, embarked upon a course of action that displeased his father. That was in direct contradiction and violation of a command given by a spiritual father. Unforgiveness and bitterness to a brother is very, very, very serious. Your boundary lines start to become blurred. And you start to cross lines that you should not cross and venture into areas that you should not venture into. Unforgiveness is not innocuous. It has lethal consequences. And you know, the end of Esau became, um, he gave birth to the Edomite nation, a nation that would pose significant threat and attack to Israel in their journey. Now, another case in point here is Lot. Lot, whose name means veiled or covering, but the root meaning of Lot means myrrh, and myrrh is an imagery of bitterness. The meaning of his name is proof that Lot harbored bitterness towards Abraham. Okay, remember there was a contention between their respective herdsmen, and then later that contention of the herdsmen became the contention of Lot and, and Abraham. And Lot displays no inclination or willingness to settle the matter in an amicable fashion. And he was willing, rather, to sacrifice a key relationship with a very key man in Scripture, Abraham, because of greed and covetousness that he harbored within his life. And they separated. In Genesis 13 it's recorded, verse 11, So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. So after the separation of Lot from Abraham, the scripture says that Lot positioned his tent towards Sodom and the men of Sodom were perverse and exceeding sinners against the Lord. Can you see how that the moment Lot comes out of the covering of Abraham, that he positions himself towards carnality? But the root of the issue is undoubt bitterness, an undoubt issue within his heart that he could have resolved with Abraham. 
When Abraham saw Lot's unwillingness to resolve the matter, he said, well, let us part. If you go east, I go west. If you go right, I go left. And he gave Lot the first option. I think sometimes um, sons of the ilk of Lot will use a dispute as a reason enough to sever the relationship so as to give vent to latent, sensual, sinful tendencies that they harbor. And they know that the father will not tolerate that while the son is under the father's governance or oversight. Now this comes as a warning to many that are listening to me today. I pray that you don't make serious life-altering decisions because of unresolved bitterness. But by the Holy Ghost, you take the time to resolve issues by the act of forgiving, if needs be, people that have hurt you, so that you keep on the path of righteousness, you keep on the path of destiny. And as you know, Lot's end is a tragic one. He makes total shipwreck of his life and destiny, and he gives birth to, by an incestuous relationship with his daughters, he gives birth to Moab and Ammon, which become the Moabites and the Ammonites. Amazingly, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, these three nations pose perpetual problems to the nation of Israel. And these three spirits have been resurrected against the church today. And I will say more about that at a later broadcast. So I want to just challenge us all that um, you can make a destiny destroying decision if it's made from the context of anger, resentment, or undealt bitterness, or an unforgiving heart. It is very important. I want to switch gears a bit. I want to talk to all those that are viewing, and specifically our household, on the matter of becoming a household of peace. Now, in session 8 of the series, I discussed how peace is an essential disposition to master if we are to be a forgiving people. And I will encourage you to consult that specific episode or session um, to uncover all the principles that we taught relative to peace governing the act of forgiveness. But in Gideon's world, Gideon was raised by God, and this is recorded in Judges chapter 6 and Judges chapter 7. And we've dealt quite thoroughly with this case study, so I don't want to go through the details here. just want to make one or two very, very important points. Gideon was a man of peace. He had a revelation of God as Jehovah Shalom. He literally had an encounter with God, where God revealed himself to him as God of peace or Jehovah Shalom is peace. That encounter with the God of peace changed the man Gideon. Gideon now became the embodiment of peace. Whatever a man sees in God, he becomes like what he sees of God. The nature of God is imparted to Gideon and Gideon becomes the embodiment of the peace of God. But God is simply not going to use Gideon as a singular man to defeat a Midianite enemy. And Midian means strife and contention. The only way to meet strife and contention is with peace. Because, like I taught you, peace is a very powerful disposition that destroys strife and contention. Might I remind you, the term Prince of Peace means this. The one who has the authority to defeat the one, the enemy, who is intent on establishing chaos and disorder. So you never meet strife with strife. You never meet hate with hate. You meet strife 
with forgiveness. The scripture says a soft answer will turn away wrath. So Gideon becomes the embodiment of peace, a man of peace prepared to deal with an enemy of strife and contention. But the spirit in Gideon is imparted to three, uh, 300 other soldiers or men whom God raised to work alongside with him. So what was true of Gideon had to become true of the 300. And the key that Gideon gave to the 300 is a simple commandment. Look at me and do likewise. Keep your eye upon me. Learn of me. In other words, copy and emulate me and do likewise. And the whole principle of 300 in scripture, uh, the symbolic meaning of the number 300 is oneness. This whole idea of covenantal joining. So here is Gideon, a man of peace. He has a 300 company functioning in love and oneness, who has now become a clan or a company of peace. And they successfully defeat the Midianites and particularly two Midianite kings. As a result, Judges 8 and verse 28 says, Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites, and did not raise its head again during Gideon's lifetime. The land had peace 40 years. So the land had peace for 40 years. But before there was peace in the land, there was peace in a man. The man Gideon became the embodiment of peace. Those under his oversight became a company of peace. And then the land became characterized by the same peace. You see, it starts with a single individual. It's transmitted to a corporate company. And what is true of the man becomes true of the company and then becomes characteristic of the land. The land will never become peaceful without a people of peace. And you'll never have a people of peace until you have leaders of peace. I'm appealing to all spiritual leaders and leaders in so-called non-spiritual domains. You have to become the embodiment of peace. People take on the predominant characteristic features of those who lead them. But it's incumbent upon those led by a man of peace to, to mimic or copy or imitate that representation of peace that they see in their leader. Gideon told his men, look at me and do likewise. In the act of observation, in the act of investigation, is a process of transfer of that same anointing in the people. And when a corporate group starts to exhibit a virtue of Christ powerfully, like peace, it will spill over to characterize the environment. The environment becomes one of peace. Now, today, if you watch the global news, there is no peace in the world. There's violence, there's hatred, there's the ugly head of racism that is rearing its head quite intensely. Um, there's divisions, there's schisms, of all kinds, across nations, between nations, in nations, amongst organizations, between organizations, even in some so-called churches, you have divisions of all kinds. The world is in need of peace. But you see, for Gideon to defeat the kings of Midian, and kings speak of principalities, kings of Midian, kings of strife, kings of contention. Gideon had to raise up a company of peace that would have worked with him to confront this enemy. Now listen to me very carefully. I believe that our local house and other houses similarly disposed are being raised up by God all over the world to become such forceful companies in which peace abides that we will be able to topple significant powers and principalities that are inciting strife, 
and contention globally. One man can't do this. It takes a corporate son. It takes a son of peace, a corporate entity of peace for this to be achieved. Now in Luke chapter 10 and reading from verse 1 to 12, you will see this reality of a son of peace come to the fore even the more. The scripture says the following, After these things the Lord appointed seventy others also and sent them two by two before his face to every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for this city. Now notice here, Jesus is sending 70 of his disciples, and we can call them apostles because the whole idea of being sent relates to an apostle. He sends them into cities, which the scripture says he was planning to go. So he sends them before him in a bid to act as preparers of the way before his literal coming. So he sends an apostolic community. This is a 70 company into cities to prepare the way for his eventual coming. And notice he sends them out not one by one, but he sends them out two by two. And two is the number of agreement. Two is the number of witness. Amos 3, 3 says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? So the whole idea of sending two is to send a spirit of oneness and a spirit of agreement. Right? This is a very strong principle that Jesus is sending into cities. And notice what he says to them. He says, I'm sending you like lambs among wolves. And the whole idea of wolves indicates a predatorial, uh, hostile environment. But they come like lambs within this environment. Now, uh, wolves will naturally and instinctually hunt lambs and literally kill them for food and other purposes. So Jesus says to the 70, you're going in the innocence of your lambness to an environment that is going to be hostile and predatorial and nasty, harsh towards you. But you're going to go not as wolves to wolves. You're going as lambs to wolves. Your immunity is not in your wolfness. Your immunity is in your lamb likeness. Now lambs are innocent. Lambs are pure. Lambs are non-retaliatory. The scripture says of Jesus like a lamb before its shearers is dumb. He opened not his mouth. Lambs are non-defensive, don't seek to justify themselves. Lambs are born to die, they're sacrificial. Their blood can absolve a whole nation of sin 
as in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, don't attempt to be retaliatory. Don't attempt to go in and meet that world with the same character or the nature of that world. Go in the opposite spirit. Go in the nature of Christ who is the Lamb of God two by two. And what I want to encourage you, I just hear the Lord saying to someone that is battling with the issue of forgiveness, they hurt you. They are hostile. They are wicked. They might be overtly nasty to you. Never meet them with the same spirit. Meet them with humility. Meet them with gentleness. Meet them in an act of forgiveness that will thoroughly um, disarm their strength. It's a lamb that disarms the strength of the wolf. And Jesus said to this 70 company going in two by two. He says, whatever city you go into, don't go to any house, but look for a house where there is a son of peace. And the word son here is euios, meaning mature son. So you look for a man of peace or in context, a son of peace. Go into his house, right? Stay in his house. Whatever is set before you, eat for the laborer is worthy of his wages. If that house receives you because there's a man of peace, then he said to this company, you shall leave your peace there. Say peace to this house. If there's any sick, heal them. Say the kingdom of God has come to you. Now, it's one thing pronouncing peace on someone that is lacking peace. That is perfectly biblical. Will you impart peace by saying peace to you? But these apostles coming in a spirit of agreement, coming in lamb-like quality, enter the house. And notice it's a corporate house. The, the reference to man of peace here indicates the leader of a household. So obviously what was true of this man in terms of his peaceful disposition has now become characteristic of his house. And to this context, Jesus instructs the apostles, say to them, peace to this house. But they are already at peace. But you pronounce further peace because Christ is still yet to come to the city and to this house. And he is further instructed them, don't go from house to house in the city. If you're going to impact a city, a house of peace in the city will affect the city. You don't mean, need many houses to infect the city. All you need are houses of peace, led by a man of peace, who leads people of peace. Because to that house, more peace is pronounced. Christ will come and the will of God will be effected. And I just perceive that this is the disposition. This is the promise to you, Gate Ministries, Durban Central, and to any other leader or person from any other household that receives this word. This is your promise. This is a prophetic promise. This teaching is largely a prophetic word to those of you who are listening to me this morning. We've received many prophecies over our corporate house that we will be ministers of reconciliation, bridge builders, priests of the Most High God. We will be given to arbitration, conciliation and mediation. We are peacemakers, not peace breakers. And church, I want you to see what God is up to. I want you to see that the leader is one of peace, one of forgiveness, one of covenant, one of love. You who are led must become a household of peace-loving people, a household of ministers of reconciliation. Because when we have a household of this ilk, I know that Christ is going to send apostolic anointing, the 70 principle, that will themselves come in a spirit of agreement and come to a house led by a son of peace and to this house say further peace to you. 
the sick will be healed, the kingdom of God will come, and Christ will come in His fullness to the house with a view to impacting the entirety of the city. I want to read a promise. I haven't really got to the kernel of my message today. I'm going to have to continue this next week. But I want to leave you with a promise. And this verse I stumbled across last night. And it says in Psalm 147 verse 12. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he has strengthened the bars of your gates. And he has blessed your sons within you. He makes peace in your borders and he satisfies you with the finest of wheat. The reference to gate here is a reference to spiritual fathering, patriarchal spiritual fathering. The reference to borders here is a reference to walls. Correctly read, verse 14 should read, He has blessed your sons within you and he makes your borders peace. Not peace in your borders. He literally makes your borders peace. Now, borders or walls refer to apostolic ministry. When apostolic ministry and doctrine is in place, and where spiritual fathering are joined to authentic apostles, it will bring immense blessing upon sons in households, such that, he says, we will be satisfied with the finest wheat. The finest wheat speaks of two issues, highest quality provision. That's what I want to encourage you to expect, the highest quality of provision. And wheat also speaks of doctrine. It speaks of a higher quality of revelation or doctrine that you and I are going to receive. You see, church, there's more that God has in mind for us mastering forgiveness than you and I could ever imagine. Don't for one moment say to me, Randolph, we've been long in this series. How long? Well, we'll take as long as it takes to master it. I am saying to all of you, you're going to enjoy the finest wheat. There'll be no sick amongst us. The kingdom of God is coming. Christ will come in a fullness that we've never known before. Because God is looking for a household of peace into which he can come to infect and affect whole cities with expressions of the kingdom of God among us. This is what I see prophetically. This is what I see with my mind's eye. And I will challenge you to not maintain or accommodate unforgiveness and succumb to torture for God to bring you to this place. Let's obey quickly. Let's obey reflexively. And come to this place with immediacy because I know of a certainty that our house and other houses as well that are similarly disposed will be used greatly by God to be transmitters of grace to whole regions. So everybody must have this corporate mindset whenever you forgive someone personally. Always remember there's a corporate result that God has in mind for you and for me. Amen. I want to encourage you to prepare your communion emblems, your juice and your bread, and we are going to participate in the table of the Lord. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The scripture says here that when Christ reconciled us to the Father, that God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world 
back to himself. And then Paul makes the statement, so I appeal to you as though God were pleading through us, be reconciled to God. You see, whenever you administrate the matter of reconciliation between one and another, you don't do it as you. You, you allow Christ to do it through you. He says, I plead with you as though Christ were pleading through us, be reconciled to God. And if you are struggling with the matter of forgiveness, take you out of the equation and allow Christ to work and flow through you. Let him make the appeal through you for the other to accept your forgiveness. Or perhaps if you need to ask the other of forgiveness for them to forgive you. But let Christ speak through you. Because if you speak through you, it might not have the required effect. God's grace will empower you to allow Him, Christ, to speak through you or appeal to you to the other to reconcile with you. And this is how you can establish peace as a peacemaker. He secured it for you and I on the cross of Calvary by His death. On that rugged cross he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus as you receive communion this morning I am trusting God that you will receive a new capacity for peace a new capacity for peace making a new capacity to be forgiving and when you do celebrate communion and as we pray in a moment you will receive grace that will allow you to become the forgiving son of God that he calls you to be. Please know this, you must be characterized as a son of peace, in a house of peace that's going to affect a whole city with peace. Gideon, the man of peace, that peace was transferred to a company, a household of peace. And eventually the whole city, or in his context, the whole nation, the land became characterized by this peace. Let's pray together as we receive this grace. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for this capacity to grow and to be extended to everyone that is listening today. Father, we know that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your Spirit. I know, oh God, this is not anything to do with us. As we've seen this principle in your word, today we trust you. We trust you, oh God, that we will become the imbibers and the ones that embody peace, forgiveness, reconciliation towards those who might have hurt us. May our household be a house of peace so that you, Christ, will come even with apostolic sending that will confirm more peace, which is more authority upon us to affect whole cities, even whole lands with the peace of God that passes all human understanding. Father, we break the spirit of strife, of division, of racism, of contentions, of anger, of bitterness within uh, our spheres that we relate to. We ask, O oh God, that you would cause us to be instruments of your peace within our social context to an ever widening degree, Lord. I pray this grace be our portion as we participate now in these sacraments, remembering your body and your blood. Father, too, we receive healing for those of us that are sick. I thank you that there'll be none sick amongst us, none will die prematurely amongst us because of our compliance to this word. We partake of this body and this blood worthily by accurately discerning your body, the family of God today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's partake, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I trust that you have been enriched by the word of the Lord. You've been challenged. And I pray that um, God's peace, grace and mercy will be your portion in ever increasing degrees. Uh, please remain safe throughout this pandemic. 
by observing all the protocols and regulations governing safety within this time. And let's master relationships by mastering forgiveness and becoming the men and women of peace that God calls us to be. God richly bless you. Amen.